All right, so yeah, so we have a full service health club, uh, which is, I don't think we've been in there before. I haven't been in there, um, by it. Okay, so yeah, we have a basketball court, we have an indoor track, we have all the traditional stuff like your cardio equipment mm -hmm. and uh, free equipment, circuit equipment, classes, spinning, so on and so forth. Um, we also have an 18 old golf course, which you can buy, that's, that's our 16 hole right there. Okay. Um, we have a, also have an indoor field facility, um, which is about a uh, 35, 40,000 square feet of the old turf area as well. Where we do soccer and lacrosse and all that as well. It used to all be tennis. We've converted okay. um, over the years. Do um, you have baseball? Um, they do do baseball in there, okay. yes, yes. They do, we've actually had. But what I'm most proud of, of all the different things that we do are my programs. We created these about five or six years ago. The first one I created was called Warrior Fitness. The idea was to get in the best shape of your adult life. Um, the concept was that I saw a lot of people coming and going from the club. And I wanted to reach more people than wow, Sorry. I was snowing up. <laughs> Sorry. I just thought it was white out of the my eye. I wanted to reach more people and keep more people involved. And I knew that we had the answers. We just had to find a way to do it. Personal training work, but it was very, very expensive. So we came up with this, um, we call it, it's not a large group, it's not a small group, it's kind of in between group size training, but it's a holistic approach. It includes nutrition, it's the first class they're ever going to take. Um, it follows with a functional movement screens, so we're looking for asymmetries or any problems or exercise screen that we need to know about. Um, and we follow also with body composition, metabolic rate, so on and so forth, and, and, and measure everything. So you can't manage what you don't measure. After that, we go through a program which is four months long. Um, there's two versions. One is Warrior Fitness, and the second one is our Total Reset Weight Loss Program. It's two set heads of the same animals, the same product. They go through the same nutrition program. They go through the same screen. And the first 30 days are identical, and that we call it foundations. We slowly on-ramp you up to the level that you can take. We're not just going to throw you in the pool until we teach you how to swim. So we don't even touch weights for the first couple of weeks. We're doing a lot of mobility. We're doing a lot of things to um, uh, improve your um, flexibility, mobility, and endurance as well. Um, and then we teach you all the different exercises that you need to know during that time period to participate in the regular workouts. Um, so you graduate from foundations after 30 days, and then you're into the tribe, you're into a little band, and you need to go, which is kind of cool. Um, with these programs, we literally help thousands and thousands of people now and have to change their lives. We have tons of people through this program. It's a thriving program. We've had fantastic results with people, dropping weight, um, going off type 2 diabetic medications, dropping their high blood pressure, or cholesterol medication, myself included. Um, so it's worked out really well. And one of the things that um, that we do with that is, uh, uh, actually we've got a lot of people on here showing, showing some of the fitness fanatics, just a couple pictures of some of our, some of our different clients oh. after workouts here. Yeah. Most of our clients, believe it or not, are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Tend to be out of weight, out of shape, um, tend to um, found something in their life that caused them that they need to come in here. Could be whatever. Could be they have to go on another medication. Could be that their partner left them. Who knows? Whatever motivation they originally find, we're going to bring them in here and try to take them from non-workout people into workout people. Um, we've had pretty good success with that. And, but today we're talking about corporate wellness and how that relates to what I do. I'm not a corporate wellness person. I don't really work in corporate wellness, but there are some similarities. Kelly, for example, lives in our program, has done our program several times. Um, and likes it. Um, her daughter has as well, Taylor. Um, so obviously we know the health costs are skyrocketing um, and we know that businesses are being forced to look at all costs related to their number one assets, which are their employees. Um, and the benefits of fit employees are numerous to both the employer and the employee. Now we heard this morning a little bit, you know, some controversy on that as well. I know and I think all of that was valid as well as what I think it's true. valid, but it's not like you're going to shift it. Exactly. You know, we've moved everybody and drove everybody to this point. So starting to work with some of the other things, but it's not, you're not going to do it overnight. I think you need to have a healthy sub uh, culture yeah. in there, obviously, in order to be for, but you still need to find ways to help keep Absolutely. people active and motivated. We Absolutely. all know that people who sleep better, eat better, Absolutely. exercise better, are probably going to be more productive, more alert at work, and be able to be better and, 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 and work harder. Um, so these include better work culture. You guys know all these. Improved productivity, reduced absenteeism, higher levels of self-confidence, lower stress, um, lower health care costs, have ideally um, an enhanced company image. Um, so it's good news from business and employees. There's huge upsides to this. Um, however, what if I told you that no matter how much money your, your company spends on corporate fitness, whether it be building in-house gyms that we see a lot of these people have, reimbursing fitness memberships, so on and so forth, 
80% of your employees still will fail to take advantage of these benefits or embrace a health and fitness lifestyle. Right? 80%, pretty much. Um, hey, I feel your pain, okay? Um, I seriously do. Because it's a universal problem that affects my business as well. Right? As, a, as an industry, um, for, for in fitness, for example, even though health clubs have been around for over 50 years, after that length of time, only 18% of the population has ever even set foot inside of a health club. That's horrible, that's horrible um, market penetration as far as an industry goes, right? Um, and that's pretty bad as far as a, for, for a company that, or an industry that's in the front line in the battle against obesity. And you had Jack Lane leading it. Uh, exactly. I mean, 50 years ago, he was doing it, right? right. Still only have 18% compared to cell phones, right? Yeah. Or computers or anything else. Why is it? Why is that? Ah. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think there's barriers that bring stop people from going in, and that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. Several years back, I realized that my fitness business, like others, is becoming a revolving door of members joining with high expectations, you know, and then dropping out when not getting the results that they expected. A lot of people have joined gyms. You may have yourself or belong to gyms. You go in there, great expectations. I'm going to do great. You get on that treadmill for the first time. You run for 45 minutes. You're like, oh, God, this is hell. Yeah. 15 minutes in, you're like, oh, God, how long? We've got TVs in front of us to try and convince us we're not on treadmills because we can't stand it. It's so awful unless you're one of those freaks that actually really loves to run all the time, you know, which most people don't. It's torture hell, and if you're not getting results right away, people burn they out, stop. and they stop, and they don't stick with it. And it's this revolving door. You've got that 20% they are always in shape. You've always known them. We all know those people. They look great. They always look like they eat anything they want. They work out all the time, and they're into it, but they're, they're freaks, right? They're a small percentage of the population. The rest of us look at them and go, what the hell? Or we even try really, really hard, and we really try hard to do it, and we follow a program, and maybe we exercise all the time, but we still don't find that we get the results that we think we should for the amount of time and effort we put into it. I eat pretty clean. I go to my class, you know, three times a week. Why don't I look like I think I should? Why don't I feel like I think I should? Why do I still need five cups of coffee to get through the day, so on and so forth? So for most people, it just seems too hard to accomplish their goals. Misinformation, fear, time constraints are all reasons why many people fail. Right? We also know about all those time constraints. I don't have time. I'm the problem. Can't get here enough. Can't do it. When fear is a big one. There's a lot of people that have never stopped into gyms because of fear. Um, so I began to change the way that I ran my business about five, six years ago. I saw this trend. I didn't like this trend. I didn't really like as far as where I saw the fitness industry going. I wanted to help more people. I wanted to get involved. I didn't want to just rent equipment to people and say, hey, the guy who wins who has the most treadmills wins. He sells it for the cheapest price wins. That's not really helping people because it's that same turnover rate. And I'm competing with all these other gyms for that same 12 to 15 or 18% of the population. They're just jumping around from gym to gym. They're not really the ones needing the help. Do you charge for spin? Do you not charge for spin? All this stuff. So I'm, you know, so I'm focused. So I decided to change my focus to the 80%. I call them the fragile legs. People that really maybe have not embraced fitness for whatever reason. And there's a lot of reasons. Um, I changed the culture of my club, the purpose, and the environment of my business. And since then, I've had a lot of success getting those people involved in programs and really helping them. And so that's what I'm talking about a little bit today. Um, so I'm going to share some of the ways that I discovered to break down those barriers and help get more employees on board with wellness, more girl employees, and my members. Okay, number one is education. You know this, right? Let's start with it. We need to make sure that all of our clients understand what really works and how long it takes. They have to understand it. If they don't, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, we have to correct those outdated, outdated ideas of how to achieve fitness. A lot of people still have really archaic ideas of what it is. This industry changes very, very, very rapidly. Exercise studies come out. Things change quickly. We're all different than we were in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. Um, this was us, you know, I love this picture, but you know, this is it, you know, in the 80s, everybody's wearing spandex and jumping around and doing aerobics and leg, leg warmers. Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, I'll start with some of these about fitness. The first one is how do I exercise? A lot of people believe that you need to do cardio in order to burn a lot of wet calories or lose weight. How do you lose weight? You get on a treadmill and run, right? You do an aerobic style exercise that can target heart rate. You should be able to jog at that, le that level, you know, and talk to the person next to me and not be out of breath, and it doesn't work. Right. We've had people do this for years and years, ever since Kenneth Cooper wrote the book Aerobics in 1968, and we got on the jogging idea and the aerobic idea, and the concept makes sense. You're in that fat burning sure. zone, and you can burn this and sustain this for a long time, but the problem is, you can run for 45 minutes on a treadmill at that target heart rate, burn that lousy 200 calories, 
great, that's the glass of wine you had last night. And 20 minutes after you get off the treadmill, your metabolism is back to where it was before it started. It didn't do anything for your basal metabolic rate. So we know how to change that. We've come out, but we've, a lot of research has shown that if you actually go anaerobic in your workouts versus aerobic with oxygen, now we're talking about with oxygen, think sprint versus jog. Now I'm not saying sprinting to kill yourself or if you can't do that yet, but we have to get your heart rate up to above 84% of your target of your maximum heart rate for even a short period of time. And then follow that with a rest period. And the rest period is just as important, if not more important, than the work. If we can do this, we found that as little as four minutes, you can get better results as far as burning calories and raising your basal, basal metabolic rate um, for up to 36 hours than you can running on a treadmill for an hour at your target heart rate. Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, Sumi Tabata, if you're familiar with Sumi Tabata, he was a professor who worked in Japan with Olympic speed skaters. And he took these Olympic speed skaters and he took two groups. He one, took one group and trained them traditionally, a couple hours a day, traditional methods. And he took another group and he had them do high intensity exercises for four minutes. And he just picked a number. He picked 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. So I'm going to have you do something, whether it's on a bike or whether it's taking a medicine ball and just throwing it at the ground and catching as hard as you can, as fast as you can for 20 seconds. Just give me all you got for 20 seconds. And then 10 seconds of rest, let your heart rate come back down, 20 seconds on. Do four different exercises, only do it twice, four minutes. Okay? And after that four minutes, only like two and a half were actual work. All right? He did that for, I don't know, I think it was eight weeks. At the end of that time period, he found the people that did four minutes of work actually got better results than the people who did two hours. And so people went crazy, the study came out, and everybody else about us, and it means a lot of different things. And it's more to do a lot of things. But what the important thing is, is that we realize that you can do um, high, uh, a great amount of work in a short period, period, uh, period of time. Um, and it's going to be at a different level. Your heart is still going to tell you where you need to be. Because for one person, you know, somebody might get to 84% walking up in front of a set of stairs. Somebody else might have to sprint to get there. But you have to train in that uncomfortable spot for a short period of time. You can't sustain it anyways because there's not enough oxygen. It's anaerobic. You're only going to have 20, 30 seconds that you can do it. And then you have to follow it with the rest. So we have to teach people how to exercise smarter um, in order to get results. It's a minimum effective dose. I talk about that a lot. If you have a headache, how much are you going to do? A lot of people say, well, I'm going to do exercise. I mean, if I want to lose weight, if I do an hour, two hours is better. Or three hours is better. I'm going to do as much as I can. Well, if I have a headache, how many aspirin am I going to take? If two aspirin take care of my headache or two Tylenol, would I take the whole bottle? No, it's a minimum effective dose. I want to do the minimal amount I can do to create that metabolic disturbance, for fat loss anyways. Metabolic disturbance means that you're causing all these microscopic tears in your body, your muscle, your heart rate has to come back down, your body has to repair that, bring your temperature back down, and it raises that basal metabolic rate for up to 36 hours. So you're burning the next day at a level, almost an extra step at the workout level. So it's the afterburn that really helps with, with high intensity training as well. It's not just that what you do during the workout, the real benefit for calorie, caloric expenditure comes after the workout. Okay, so it's really important, so rest is important then as well. Um, time is the other misconception we get a lot. People think, we just talked about this a little bit, people think you can spend hours and hours and hours in the gym and get results. Um, but in fact, we just talked about the four minutes in Sumi Tabata. Uh, you can get that in interval training. At Pine Grove, our clients achieve results working on an average of 45 minutes. But of that 45 minutes in our workouts, about 15 to 20 of it is warm up. And then we have an instructional period where we discuss what we're going to do that day and go over everything again, review again, and then we do the work. The work sometimes only, is only 12 to 20 minutes with periods of rest in between. So we're not doing a huge period of rest, but we're still getting really great fat loss results, metabolism increases, and everything else that we get through that sleep improvements and so on and so forth. So, I don't have to live in the gym, loss of this. This means that your employee, for your employees, they don't have to spend hours chained to a treadmill and get excellent results in very short workouts two or three times per week. Um, so, education is important on this and bring that in. Um, the next educational point is nutrition. Well, another point of confusion for most people is, is this nutrition. So, um, for weight loss, what goes in your body and mind is the most important thing. You cannot out-train a bad diet, period. Yeah. Can I do it, right? Absolutely. So if you've got a Ferrari and you've got lousy gas, it's full of water, and you're putting that in the tank, that Ferrari is not going to perform like a Ferrari. It's going to perform like a crappy car that's not really worth anything. Okay, it might look good, but it's not going to move very well. Same thing with our bodies. We have to wonder about what goes in. 
people don't really realize what it is. When you start to scratch above the levels, it actually gets kind of scary with everything that's going on with our nutrition in the last 100 years. It's really changed dramatically since industrialization. So many diets, where do you start? You know, Atkins diet, this diet. What I find works for my clients, works the best for me, is something called clean eating, which you're probably familiar with. Um, it's, you know, it's akin to paleo, maybe, if you want. I don't love the term paleo. But basically what we're talking about here is eating simple, clean foods. We're trying to get away from factory foods. We're trying to get away from foods that have a lot of ingredients that we can't pronounce in them, so on and so forth. Um, concepts to eat foods that are real and only have nutritional value. And try to limit or eliminate the ones that are the worst for us. Um, example would be sugar. Sugar is the number one public enemy. Okay. For years and years and years, people always thought that like, you know, the problems are like fat, we've got fat free foods, all these different things. But sugar is public enemy number one. hundred years ago, the average American ate three pounds of sugar a year. Today, the average American eats well over 175 pounds of sugar a year. That's a buttload of sugar. That's like if you go to like Home Depot and you get some big sacks of fertilizer, like five of those, and throw it on the table, that's how much sugar we're eating. People go, well, I don't eat a lot of sugar. I don't put sugar in my coffee. I don't drink a lot of soda. It's in everything. <laughs> It's in everything. You get your fat-free salad dressing. It's got sugar in it. You get your chinelli sausage. It's got sugar in it. You pick up your tomato sauce. It's got sugar in it. We're a nation addicted to sugar. And so they put sugar in everything because otherwise people don't like it. Because we need to have that sugar in order to satisfy the taste buds. Mayo Clinic, actually, 93% um, of rats um, choose sugar over cocaine. Wow. Just so you know, that's, that's crazy. fact. 93%. That's crazy. Sure. sure. Is it that good for the rats to choose sugar over cocaine? No, it's saying how it's addictive. More, it's more addictive. It's more addictive. I mean, yeah, it's good for them, but I just, you know, that's crazy. Yeah, no, this is well, there was a study too, I don't know if you heard about this, with mice. Well, they took two sets of mice, one of them they kept them thin, um, they, kept, they didn't give them any sugar, they kept them lean by just giving them regular food. The other set, they put sugar in the water every single day and fed them and they got really obese. Right. So what happened though, this is the kind of gross part, but it's interesting, they actually put the obese mice on a starvation diet. They cut off their food, but they kept the sugar in the water. Those mice eventually died of starvation. But the interesting point about that, or the sick part, is that when they died, they still had 60% more body fat than only in healthy mice. Because the sugar was in the water, they, the idea is that its insulin response from that stopped them from effectively burning the sugar, you are burning the fat to keep them alive. You should be able to use that fat storage to stay alive, right, in theory, right? But when you have sugar, it's toxic in your bloodstream, right? Your pancreas has to deal with it, right? So it releases the insulin, the insulin combines it and with a, uh, and puts it into a, into a, a fat cell, kind of guards the door. As long as you have sugar in your bloodstream, you're never going to effectively be able to burn the sugar and the fat that you have. That's why when we have people work out, we tell them a good pre-workout food is never to have fruit even, or any type of thing like that. You really want to have fat or protein. Because otherwise, you're just going to burn that banana that you had. Halfway through the workout, you're going to crash because you don't have any energy left from it, and you're not going to teach your body to burn the fat. So, so there's a lot of different reasons on why sugar helps keep us fat. Um, next one is fat. We talk about a lot of people think that eating fat makes us fat. Um, naturally occurring fats from whole foods are actually satiators, though. And they actually, if you're having the right type of fats, are actually really positive for you. Fats are the only thing that don't have an insulin response. So there's no insulin response to fat. Um, but we were, you know, we've been told for the last 50, 60 years that we should, you know, eliminate butter, we should eliminate all of our saturated fats, and they were really bad for us. But an interesting story on that, in 1910, they invented the electrocardiogram machine, you know, to check for heart disease. And they brought it to the American Heart Association, the Heart American Medical Society. The American Medical Society said, laughed and said, we don't need this. No one dies of heart disease. It was such a small problem in 1910, no one cared about it. By 1950, uh, by 1950, more than 40% of American deaths were from heart disease, right? So what changed? Well, if they believe what they told us was saturated fat, bacon fat, butter, all these things were bad for us. Well, that okay. But then there should be a, a there should be a direct correlation to the amount of saturated fat in the American diet over that time because heart disease continued to rise right through the 1970s. We should have been eating tons. But actually, where I'm going with this, when you look at consumption of fat in 1910, we ate 17 and a half pounds of butter a year on average. By 1970, we ate less than three pounds of butter a year. Saturated fat consumption during that time period dropped by 48%, but heart disease continued to go up. So what changed? What was the difference? Well, sugar consumption went up 600 times, but also the consumer did what we were told. We started eating all of the different short names. We started using vegetable oils. We started using margarine. 
All these different things which are high in omega-6 fatty acids within small amounts are okay, but when we're finding now that we have them in large amounts, they're actually promote heart disease. And it's just the opposite. So we followed what they told us and got sicker. Um, so, so fast do not make you fast. You just want to make sure you're eating the right type of fats. If you're eating animal fat, it should ideally be organic and grass fat if you can. That's going to be your best choice. It doesn't have all the chemicals and preservatives and junk in it, right, uh, as well. Uh, processed foods as well. We're going to try to avoid factory foods. Processed foods are less nutritional value, or have less nutritional value. They're more calorie dense than the French natural counterparts. Uh, uh, nutritional value is processed out of them, so a lot of times they don't satisfy you. Lean cuisine doesn't care about nutritional value. They want to get to be 200 calories make it look good, it tastes good, but at the end of the day, there's no nutritional value, and your body's not stupid, it knows that. You eat that, you're still hungry. The calories didn't satisfy you. It's not the calories, because there wasn't a nutritional value, it's been cooked out. You want to try, always try to choose the fresh, natural counterparts. You want to go for, as a rule of thumb, for ingredients that have less, have, uh, products that have less than six ingredients, or ideally just one ingredient, it's an apple. It's broccoli, it's a single ingredient. We use those to cook with versus going to eat some freeze dried apple chip coming with some sort of like cinnamon sauce, right? Which has no nutritional value anymore. We can't convince ourselves that these are, these are healthy for us. Um, so, so we're gonna try to avoid those processed and factory foods. And a lot of this is just this educational portion. It's like, yeah, easier said than done, but if you, the, first, the first battle in this is understanding what the problem is. And when you really start to think about it and your eyes open up a little bit about it, it helps you to make those better food choices. But you have to understand the choices that you're making before you do it. So we spend a tremendous amount of time in this in our program. And it's one of the reasons I think that we're successful is because we really try to train, not just diet, like I can give you a sheet and say, eat this for 30 days right. and you're going to lose weight. Of course you will. You put anybody on any kind of calorie restricted diet and make them work out every day, they're going to lose weight. But they're going to put it all back on. So how do we maintain it? How do we build new habits? And that's what we're trying to do. What substitutions can we do? Nutrition is the most important part, I think, of this whole program. It brings wellness into your house, and it's something you can follow through whether you're in the gym or wherever you go. Okay, second big barrier we find a lot of people is overcoming fear. Um, it's a lot of people that are afraid of gyms. There's a lot of people afraid of working out. We had that, you know, Valleys did a great job of ruining that in the 1990s and 80s. You know, there's like supermodels and like spandex in front of mirrors. You know, and somebody's looking at the mirror and go, I don't look like that. I gotta lose weight before I join the gym. Right. You know, they wouldn't even walk in the gym because they were terrified of even walking in the door. Right? That's the same problem in corporate fitness. There's a lot of people that work out in, you know, that you might have a gym in your office, but a lot of people won't do it. They're not going to work out in their gym, or they're not going to, even if you incentivize them or penalize them like this brought up this morning. Um, the fear comes in several forms. One of them is how do you, how do you start? You know, how am I going to how am I going to begin this program? I don't really know what to do. So 80% needs someone who will help guide them into fitness, teach them goal setting, nutrition, exercise, how to create a roadmap for success. We do this in our program, and you really need to do it in your and make it available in, the, in corporate fitness as well. You have to have somebody there to guide them and give them the proper education and take them through it and help them teach them to do these things. The second one is fear of failure. Most, most people, have, well, many people have tried fitness before and failed it. You know, the perfect person that walked in into that treadmill. Um, we have to show them that there's another way. Um, at Pine we, we train in small groups in our programs. So the idea, or I said medium-sized groups. Everyone is in the same boat. It builds a sense of community is the idea behind it. It's harder to work out by yourself. It's actually easier to work out and more enjoyable in a group and more fun. Group camaraderie is what helps bring you through it. Um, we help each other along. We're all in the same boat. We're all leading the same way. We're all doing the same workout today. Oh, we all got to do this. So we're all in it. We can sympathize, and the group brings that dynamic along. It's much, much, much more difficult to do it on your own. Um, that sense of community is very important to help alleviate this fear. Um, you can have this in your company as well. You just have to let the employees know that you have their back. They have to feel that they can um, do it without having to worry about failure or being judged which is the next one by their peers. Um, well, I look stupid, can I keep up? You know, next to public speaking, this is probably my number one biggest fear that people have, yeah. right? So, will I ruin everybody else's workout? So these are all valid points. People, I hear this a lot. People go in there like, I don't know if I can do it. I'll talk to them about our programs and go like, well, what if I, I can't keep up with everybody else yet? I need to use a trainer first by myself, mm -hmm. and then I'll join the program. And I'll tell them no, because what we've tried to do in our workouts, and this is important, 
type of workouts that you are going to offer workouts in your, in your facility or in your business, the type of workouts really should be ones where people don't have to keep up. If you think about a traditional step class or a traditional aerobic class, if everybody feels like they got to keep with the beat and keep up with anybody and do the grapevine left or whatever, and if they can't do it, they feel stupid, they feel like they're standing out, they get frustrated, and it's very, very hard. Maybe they've done that once, they don't want to have to repeat that embarrassment again. So what we do in our workouts is we structure them so that everybody has to do the same workout with their own modifications, they'll have modifications, but everybody's doing it at their own level, they're all finishing at different times, they're all using a different amount of weight, and they all have their own modifications. So while we're all in the same group having to complete this type of a workout, everyone's at different levels, and then we just cheer with us for the person who finishes last. We have the group of the community come in and try to really support that person who's going, and maybe that's a little embarrassing for them, but they actually really seem to like it because we'll say, come on, come on, you can do this, Joe. Go ahead, finish it up. You're almost there, you're almost there. And there's that sense of accomplishment and group dynamic that helps bring them in, but they didn't feel like, they didn't, you know, if somebody has to go, they have to go. They're not holding anybody up. It doesn't really matter if they did their workout a little differently or with a different amount of weight or a different tempo. So we try to set themselves, this is what I was talking about, set them up for success, train at your own pace, is what we just talked about. Um, the bar third barrier is consistency. If they're not consistent, they're going to fail, right? right? I love that one. They're going to fail. We have to make wellness a habit and succeed long to succeed long term. You have to replace negative with positive and repeat, right? Change breakfast foods, right? Most of us are creatures of habit. We talk about nutrition again. If I ask you what you have for breakfast every day, it's probably pretty much the same thing most days, right? Or it's probably the same, you have the same five or six things you eat every week for dinner. Right? This is pizza night, this is pasta night, this is steak night, whatever. We have our thing, our takeout night, and we have those things. My secret when I work with people in nutrition is say, like, okay, we can still do that. We just have to find something that you like, that you really, really like, that you enjoy, and we can substitute one of those really bad ones with this new one that you'll enjoy, and this becomes your regular go-to in the new five. So we'll take one out, we'll put this here. So maybe instead of making our chicken this way, we're gonna try it this other way. And we're gonna cook it with you know, rosemary and olive oil and you know and lemon and we're gonna use butternut squash. We're gonna do something you really, really like. And we're gonna, we're gonna substitute this. And if they enjoy that, that becomes their new habit over time. If we're having cereal for breakfast every morning and we're realizing that's, that's not the best, the milk has lactose, which is sugar, right? It's probably processed. Fat free is the worst. You probably should have any whole fat if they're gonna do it, honestly. It's a satiator. You should be trying to go whole, whole uh, non homogenized organic. Don't even get started on pasteurization. Or any of the other coconut stuff. Milk. I'm a coconut milk. Right, exactly. Go to almond milk, maybe instead, unsweetened, make sure there's no carrageenan in it. We're going to work with them on different options. Or, you know, hey, have some eggs. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not that hard. And you can prepare for that. Let's talk about ways we can prepare our meal prep on Sunday to get ready for the rest of the week. And so we're trying to strategize with them to work out new ways. And once they adapt to it, it actually becomes pretty easy to do. I do it, and so I don't expect them to do anything I do. I don't do. I've been eating this way for four or five years. I've been able to, you know, my cholesterol when I was on statin and I worked out and everything else for six years I was able to drop it from 265 to 150 and I've kept it there you know and I eat lots of fat which is interesting I'll sit in the doctor's office getting my cholesterol checked and I'm looking at the brochure from Eli Lilly but what you should know about your cholesterol is telling me things like coconut oil are bad for me because they're high in fat and everything else and stay away from fatty foods I'm like this is so outdated doc yeah. you know this shouldn't even be on the wall they just want to keep me on a statin right you know they do right exactly um, the next one is, 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 is for consistency is to schedule it. It's really important to schedule your workouts. Okay, <laughs> you have to be consistent to have workout. You have to be consistent. You have to have your workout workouts scheduled on a regular basis. That's why group workouts work really well and partners work out really well. Try to find a partner to work out with or work in that group setting. Because I know, even myself, if my partner's coming at six o'clock to work out with me, I'm going to work with them at six o'clock, or I'm letting my partner down. My group, if I'm not there with my group, they're all like, "Where were you? How come you weren't here?" That camaraderie, that certain sense of feeling of waiting for people depending on you to be there. You needed to be there to support me in my workout. I was there to support you. Helps keep you consistent and helps you on it. If you think you're going to do it on your own, most of us are procrastinators. I'm going to work at 5 o'clock. Oh, you know, it came up at the office, and then it was 5.15, and then it was 6 o'clock, and then it was 6.30, and then I was like, oh, I'm too tired. It's late. And then no, I'll start again tomorrow. And that becomes a pattern over and over and over again. We've got to schedule it. It's got to be in our, it's important. I hate when people tell me there's no time. I'm like, look, you need like three hours a week. Or, hey, you know what? If that's for a class. If you're not on your own, you can schedule something different. That's why I go at 5.15 in the morning because I know I'm not right. at night time. Sure. I have 
have to go in the morning. Got to go. Got to schedule it. Yeah. Got to do it. Yeah. And that's going to help keep you on track. Otherwise, prevention. And the group work out. You're right about the group work. You know, yeah. I like doing it. You have your friends there. You start to see them. They're there. They're expecting to see you. Maybe you like your coach. So on and so yeah. forth. And also, it has to be convenient. So obviously, we have to make it easy to participate. Most health club markets are a three to five mile ring around the club. That's my market. I'm, I'm, I'm a Camillus. I'm not marketing in DeWitt. No one's going to drive from DeWitt to Camillus to work out. They might for one of my programs, but they're not going to do it for a typical health club membership. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing something extraordinary that something can't get anywhere else, maybe they'll drive for that. Yeah. But they're not going to do it for a treadmill. So they can do a program without being a member? Oh, yeah. Oh. Sure. You get a membership for free with the programs, actually. So we include it in there. Okay. Exactly. Um, but, um, but it's the same price, you know. But if you're an existing member, we'll leave your membership alone and discount the program by the cost of your membership. So on my march to my market, it's a three to five mile, three to five mile ring. It has to be convenient. People need to either work out where they work or where they live. You know, and tough with work is that people don't always work live where they work, so we're doing weekends. That might be a good time to work out, they still feel like they haven't shown a gym. So it's not always really that effective when we you know, drive back to work and try to work out. But, you know, um, so allow employees to participate in fitness programs near their homes. Don't just pick one spot. If it won't be convenient, then maybe we're going to fail that. Um, the last, also, another one is commitment and accountability. You'll only hold yourself accountable for goals that others know about. It's really hard. It's really easy to Don't take write it down. your goals. Tell it's, it's just some, a wish. Exactly. It's just a wish. Exactly. So give me your goal. I'm the, I'm the fitness partner that convinced the group to go to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to work out. You got four opposites. Four opposites. <laughs> <laughs> um, so oftentimes, loan for fitness memberships are completely free, in my opinion, with no guidelines. It's difficult to hold the employee accountable. Mm -hmm. When there's no accountability, the programs are often viewed as not being valuable and therefore fail. I really believe employees need to have skin in the game. They've got to be accountable, they've got to be able to have a little money or something in there that's, that's skin in the game to make them do it. Otherwise, it's free and uh, I don't care about it and it doesn't have any value. I can have the best program in the world and if I give it to people for free, they don't care about it and they might not take advantage of it. I, for example, my, my wife actually works for Baker's Healthcare Group, which is one of the ones oh, that were here. And they have a club and they have all the stuff there and she works out and, and so we have this conversation. They all have our personal trainer. Anybody in there can have a free personal trainer whenever they want them. You know how many people use it? The same 20%. The other 8%, they have a free trainer, one-on-one. -on -one. They can go and they can leave their office, put their desk, put their books down, walk across to the gym, get paid to do it, wow. work out with the trainer, and they still don't do it. Okay? It's free, maybe, but maybe there's some of these other barriers as well. Maybe they're embarrassed to do it in front of the facility. It might be the fear yeah. thing. Could be all these different problems that bring people in. Um, Goal setting is also important, so we really have to make individual, um, help individuals set realistic goals and then help them to reach those goals. Knowing how to set goals is one of the most important aspects of fitness, in my opinion. If you don't have goals, you don't know where you're going. You can't manage what you don't measure. So we've got to create goal setting with these people as well, with our network, our employees as well, and ask them, and that's their goal. Where do you see yourself? Where do you want to be? What's in it for you? How do you want to do it? You know, I always do, I used to do this campaign called Find Your Reason. You know, everybody has a different reason to work out. You know, maybe it's because you want to be there when your kids graduate from college. Maybe it's whatever. Maybe it's you want to look good in your, you know, at your wedding. Whatever your reason is, you got to find your reason and make it, a, you know, and hang it on the wall. You know, and that's your thing, and that's your goal, and that's your reason to do it. You know, and if we don't, we just push it off and push it off and push it off and until it's too, it's too late. And unfortunately, I get a lot of people that'll come after that moment. Husband left. Him. You know, somebody left, and now I got to be naked in front of somebody again for the first time. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I'm a counselor too. So, oh my God, you know, you know that, that can't tell me. I, I'm sure you've heard the story. I've had people come in to, to consult on a fitness membership and leave in tears. Not because I did anything, but because we just talked about it and I'm feeling cucking out, you know, 10 minutes later or hugging it out yeah. or 20 minutes later because yeah. we peeled the onion far enough. Like, okay, why do you want to get in shape? And obviously, says, well, why, why do you want to lose weight? Right. I want to lose weight and I want to tone up. Okay, why? <laughs> well, I, I want to look better. Okay, why? You know, you just keep asking why, and ultimately you get down to like, because that asshole left me for a secretary, and no, 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 no,
and you know that's something. So leading by example as well, creating a healthy culture. He touched on this this morning. You know the healthy employees are a win-win for the company to work for. Through education, over overcoming fear, and teaching habit formation, we can get a higher percent of our general employee, percentage of our employees to adopt a healthy lifestyle or a healthier lifestyle. But we must also create a healthy and positive culture within our workplace. The people at the top must take the initiative and must lead by example. Same thing, we have to have that feeling that you know it's supported here, it's important to the business, it shouldn't be forced down their throat, it shouldn't, you know, but you do have to nurture that. It goes through. I thought he did a great job of talking about that this morning. I thought that was important as well. So what's next for your company? You know, I've given you a few strategies, but it's up to you to implement them. I'd start with education and branch out from there. You know, if you need help or questions about what we do, or any way that, that could apply to what you guys do, I'm available 100 percent afterwards. Or, or now, <laughs> ask away, and I'm willing to help. Um, and one more thing. In my opinion, fitness is a series of choices we make every day. Think about what changes you need to make now to improve the quality of life for you and your employees in the future. And that's me. Awesome. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank Thanks. I'm glad I had two people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had four, four or five. So. Yeah? No, that was great. Very cool. passionate about I am, and I, and, I, and I like it. You know, it's actually interesting because I've been in this business for 25 years, and I'm more passionate about it now than when I started. Mm -hmm. The last four, five years, probably, especially. I, you know, before it, it became more of a business, and for a while it became like this card game, a shuffle game of replace, how many members did we lose, how many did we add, right. and it became this like awful Why thing that I didn't enjoy doing anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, those people that were there and liked it, you got a lot from them. Oh, I like your club. Like, you know, what do you like about my club? It's nicer, it's cleaner, it's more convenient. Yeah. You know, you can do certain things to make it better. But at the end of the day, I didn't really feel like I could, I need to reach people well, more really than just people. a clean shower. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you're really you know? helping people change their lives. And that's, what, that's what's cool about it. And that's actually like, it's like one of the coolest jobs in the world. Yeah. If you have that and you get that feedback from people, mm -hmm. it's really, really awesome. And I made a lot of great friends yeah. and relationships. Yeah, well, you awesome. know, then they help you back, Absolutely. you know? So it's actually really cool. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening to my skill. Absolutely. Are you? Do you have a booth down there? I had a table. Yeah, it's down there. I have a booth. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to stay much longer. Yeah. I haven't had too many people to buy it, but okay. I got stuff. If you have any interest or anything. Yeah, I might grab some stuff. On the yeah, table. I'm going to leave some stuff on the table as well. Um, okay. If you have any questions about it, um, if you do live in our side of town, we offer a 21-day free trial. You can come in and use the club. Check it out for free. And all of our things come with 30-day money.